Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. So uh, my presentation is uh, called What's in a Name? Understanding Species, Cultivars, and Hybrids. So this is a summary of what we'll be covering tonight. So we'll discuss common names, botanical names, a brief history of them, pronunciation, the binomial system, species, and all the examples are going to be uh, North Carolina natives. Uh, we'll talk about subspecies, varieties, and forms, and then finally native cultivars and hybrids. And then we'll learn resources to discover more about our native flora, and then we'll look at research to help us understand how native cultivars and hybrids fit into a garden landscape and restoration projects. So why can't we just use common names? They're easier to remember, they're most broadly known, and often they're derived from botanical names. However, plants typically have multiple common names to learn. Another person may not know or use the same common name that you know. They're limited to people of one language or region of a country, and many names aren't unique to a specific plant. So here we have examples of honeysuckle. So going by just the common name, you can see that there's multiple varieties of honeysuckle and multiple varieties of bush honeysuckle. However, two of these are rank one invasives and two are North Carolina natives. And when we're going by the botanical names, we can easily distinguish the difference. And the rank one invasives are gonna be the plants that we want to avoid planting in our yard and also remove if we have them on our properties. All right, another example. So here we have two clematis vines. They both have small white flowers and they both bloom the same time of year. However, one is clematis ternoflora, which is the uh, non-native and it's also considered a rank one invasive and then we have our native Clematis virginiana. So a brief history of botanical names. So Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish naturalist. He first invented the binomial, si binomial system of nomenclature. He described and named thousands of plants and animals, and his book was released in 1753. And many of the names came from books about medicinal plants and medicines that can be derived from them. So these are the major ranks of the taxonomic hierarchy. So we're only going to be focusing on the bottom two of the uh, pyramid here. So this is just kind of an example to give you a general idea of it. So here we have the, an example of the family Asteraceae, and that's going to be the largest family of flowering flora, and they have composite flowers. So in that family, there are 32,000 different plants. Within that family, there are over 1,900 genera. But when we're dealing with the botanical name, it's going to use one genus and one species. And that will refer to one specific plant. So a little way to remember, a genus would be the generic, and a species would be a specific. So the binomial system. So prior to this, plants and animals were designated by polynomials, long descriptive names that varied from author to author. There was little agreement on how to group and organize knowledge about plants and animals. As more plants were discovered across the world, names became progressively longer, usually between five and 10 words, but sometimes more than 20 to describe a single plant. The binomial system created a quick and efficient way to name them. So why did they choose to use Latin? So it was not biased to a single country and it was commonly written in. And then many languages have Latin roots. And then for using Latin with botanical names, non-Latin words are Latinized. And since it uses Latin, uh, Latin has gender specific endings. So genus and species usually agree in gender. So they would have matching endings of A, US, or UM. However, sometimes when a species is a noun, it may not agree. Um, a botanical name consists of two or more Latinized words. And that's considered a binomial. And they're gonna always be written in italics. So you have a genus, which the plural is genera. That's the larger group the plant belongs to, and it's gonna be always capitalized. And they are nouns that have gendered endings. And then we have species, and that's gonna be the exact plant you were referring to. Always lowercase, only used once per genus, often an adjective that is descriptive of some aspect of the plant. It could be color, form, size, the habitat that it grows in, the geography that's located, the history of the plant, or it could be named to honor someone. And then finally, when the species is unknown or you are speaking about multiple species within a genus, you would use the, uh, instead of a species name, you use SPP, which means species pluralis. There's lots of pictures later, I promise. <laughs> I know it's a lot of text right now. <laughs> All right, so pronunciation of binomial names. So there are no silent syllables, so you just sound it out. 
And since Latin is a dead language, there is no correct way, just some general guidelines, <laughs> all right? And then one thing to remember with Latin, they, it has enunciated syllables, so we'll talk about that. So here we have Acer rubrum, which is our red maple. So for two syllable words, it's always gonna be the first syllable that gets enunciated. So here it would be pronounced Acer, and that means sharp or pointed. And then we have rubrum, which means red, and that's where the name comes from. All right, so this example here is Quercus virginiana. And again, we have a two syllable word, so Quercus. And uh, it's an unknown origin, either from an early English language or from a gr Greek word meaning rough because it describes the bark, or a Greek word meaning acorn. In most other cases, it will be the second to last syllable that will be enunciated, as in Virginiana. And that's gonna be our live oak, Quercus Virginiana. If the last syllable consists of two vowels or seems naturally short, you stress the third to last syllable. So here we have echinacea from the Greek meaning hedgehog, and that describes the spiky inflorescence of the flower. And then we have purpurea, which describes the petal color. So we have echinacea purpurea, which is our purple cone flower. All right, and then finally, if you have a CH, it makes a K sound. So in this example here, we have kelone, from the Greek meaning tortoise, and glabra, which means smooth and hairless. So that's kelone glabra, which is the white turtle head. All right, so earlier I mentioned that uh, different genera can share the same species name. So here we have three examples of plants that all have the species name glabra, which means smooth and hairless. So we have the Rus glabra, the Ilex glabra, and the Caloni glabra, which we looked at just a second ago. So Rus simply comes from the Greek word meaning sumac, so that's smooth sumac is the common name on that one. And then we have um, the Ilex glabra, and Ilex, so all the hollies, uh, come from Quercus ilex, which is an English oak that has small pointed leaves that are similar to uh, a lot of the hollies that we have. This one, however, is different. Uh, it gets the name glabra because the leaves themselves are actually smooth and not pointed. Kelone gets its species name from having smooth stems and leaves. Genus and species agree in gender. So here we have uh, grandiflorus, which means with large flowers. And you can see here that if it's hibiscus, grandiflorus, magnolia, grandiflora, or cephatrichum, grandiflorum. So even though these all have different endings, they all mean with large flowers. And this is typically in relation to other plants in the species, because um, looking at these examples here, you can easily see that the aster flower is nowhere near as large as the magnolia flower. However, for an aster, that is a distinctive characteristic of that one. And another interesting thing about the uh, Cipitrichum grandiflorum, it is a species that is native just to the Piedmont. So here we have Flava, which means pure yellow. So we have Saracenia, and that's named after Mike Sarazen, who was French-born Canadian naturalist. So the yellow pitcher plant would be Saracenia Flava. We have the yellow honeysuckle, which is Lonicera Flava. And that's named after Adam Lonitzer, who was a German physician and botanist. And you'll see that a lot, a lot of uh, genera names come are basically named after botanists or scientists. And then finally we have Esculus flava, which is the yellow buckeye. Esculus means edible acorn. All right. So velosa means with soft hairs. So we have viola velosa. And so this is going to be a violet that has uh, hairy leaves uh, and stems. And then we have heuchera velosa which is gonna be a heuchera that has hairy leaves and stems. How and why do botanical names change? So there is an international code of nomenclature for algae, fungi, and plants. Um, their aim is to avoid and reject names that will cause confusion. And uh, reading DNA has become more cost efficient, so we can closely study DNA variants between samples of species, and then we use that information to draw conclusions on how the DNA changes over time, and that can give us a better understanding about the relationship between plants. And then finally, when a name changes, adoption of a new name by the public doesn't happen immediately. So you may see the old name used until it becomes more widely accepted, or you may see examples such as Eutrochium fistulosum, previously known as Eupatorium fistulosum, or Cephatrichum grandiflorum, previously known as Aster grandiflorus. 
And in these two examples, so eutrochium, or sorry, the eupatorium uh, genera was broken into smaller pieces. So all the Joe Pye weeds now fall under eutrochium. And it went from about 2,200 different plants down to, I believe, only uh, a handful now. And uh, with the aster change, Cifatricum uh, is now a, 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 gen a genus that designates North American species of aster. So now if you ever see uh, a plant that falls under that genus, you can know that it is native to North America. Okay, so some species describe the plant's leaves. So here we have the genus Asclepius, which is the milkweed. It's named after Asclepios, the Greek god of medicine. So if you have an Asclepius that has whorl or whorls, uh, sorry, if the leaves are whorled around the stem, that would be Asclepius verticillata. If you find an Asclepius where the leaves are clasping the stem, that would be Asclepius amplexicollis. If you find an Asclepius that has a leaf in the shape of a spear, lanceolata. And then finally, a Asclepius with four leaves is Asclepius quadrifolia. <laughs> so species can describe the flower's color. So we have uh, Asclepius incarnata. So incarnata means color of flesh for the color of the flowers. We have Asclepius purpurescens, which uh, means that the flowers essentially become purple as they bloom. And then lastly, we have Asclepius rubra. And this one, though you look at the picture, the flowers do look pink. There's actually variants in the species where they could be pink, lavender, red, or even purple. This uh, species name designation has existed since Carl Linnaeus originally named it. So more than likely, the sample that drawing that he got was of a red flowered plant. And that's where it got its original name, which is stuck with it. All right. So when a species looks like something else, you can have the ending effolium, which means with leaves like. So here, we have a viburnum acer, acerifolium, which means that it has leaves like an acer, which is a maple. And similar to the uh, acer rubrum, they both have fantastic fall color. Species names can describe where it grows. So Nova Barensis means from New York. So here we have Vern Vernonia Nova Barensis and Amoropelta. Nova Barensis, which is New York ironweed and the New York fern. So now we'll take a second and look at this resource. So this is the flora of the southeastern United States. Um, you can find it on the North Carolina Botanical Garden website, and then it's uh, Allen Weekly, and the Southeastern Flora team updates it. When you go to search on this, you have to use a botanical name to get it to pull up the plants. To the left here, you can see the floral area. So when you here a reference of this plant's native to the southeast. That's going to include all the way north to Pennsylvania, down to Florida, over into parts of Texas. All right, so to the right are when you search the plant up, this is the map that you'll get. So you can see here, this is the native range of Vernon, uh, Vernonia novobarensis. So the solid black square means that it's common in that area. The square with the dot in the center means that it's going to be uncommon. And then whenever uh, you have just the empty square, that's going to mean that it's going to be rare to that area. And there's other designations for if they're not sure if the plant's actually from there and they, or if it's, they know that it's been brought there by cultivation and is out in the wild now. And similarly, we can look at the, uh, the New York fern and same sort of thing. Its range is going to be the northeastern portion of uh, the southeast. Some species can highlight the differences between different plants. So we have, uh, if you're looking at Monarda, it's going to be named after Nicolas Batista Monardes, who was a Sp Spanish physician and botanist. A Monarda with spots on the petals would be Monarda punctata. Um, most mints have hollow stems, but uh, Monarda fistulosa, fistulosa would be hollow, so it designates that the plant has a hollow stem. Monarda didyma, and that means uh, in pairs or twins, and that's in relation to the uh, flower petals. And then finally, Monarda clinopodia, which uh, is wild basil. So the genus Magnolia. So this is named after Pierre Mangol, who's a French botanist. Uh, if you, a magnolia that is connected with Virginia is Magnolia virginiana. 
a magnolia with large and long leaves is Magnolia macrophylla. And just to give you an idea, the leaves on these can be up to 32 inches long. So you can imagine looking at this and knowing how long the leaves are, how gigantic that flower is. But the, the leaf size is the more distinctive identifier, so that's why they went with, uh, with that. And then finally we have Magnolia tripetala, which means with three petals. And in the picture you can see you know, that it's starting to open and you see the three petals, but these typically have six to nine petals. So this name actually refers to the sepals, which is the uh, portion of the flower that covers the buds before they open which essentially protects the flower, and those are in threes. So that's really where, uh, what that name is describing. So here we have the genus Rudbeckia, which is named after father and son, Olas Johannes Rudbeck and Olas Olai Rudbeck, and they were Swedish scientists. So if you have a Rudbeckia that has leaves that are divided into narrow sections, that would be Rudbeckia lacinata. If you have a Rudbeckia with shining and glistening flowers, Rudbeckia fulgida. And then if you have a Rudbeckia that has leaves with three lobes, that would be Rudbeckia triloba. And then here you can see the leaves of the three different species. So you can see that on the lanceonata, how the leaves are divided into small sections. And then on the triloba, not all the leaves will have three lobes, but if you look on the plant, you will definitely find some that uh, have the three distinctive lobes. Pygnanthemum, so that's from Greek meaning dense flower. So we have Pygnanthemum muticum, and uh, muticum means blunt, and that's describing uh, the blunt flowers. We have Pygnanthemum incanum, which is describing the gray leaves, and we have Pygnanthemum tenifolium, which describes the slender leaves on that species. Trilliums, so trillium, meaning triple because the flower parts are in threes. So we have a trillium with spots, that's trillium maculatum. There's a trillium that's named after Mark Catesby, and that's uh, trillium catesbii. And we have a trillium that has flowers of two completely different colors, and that's trillium discolor. And on these, um, it's hard to see from the picture, but they have yellow petals and purple stamens, and that's where it gets its name. So eutrochium, which is our Joe Pye weed. So this is from the Greek meaning good wheel. So if you have a eutrochium that has purple stems, that would be eutrochium purpureum. Uh, eutrochium fistulosum would uh, have stems that are completely hollow. And then you have eutrochium dubium, which means doubtful or unlike the rest. <laughs> and just to answer the question, uh, how is it unlike the rest? And this took me a while to figure this out, but I finally did. When you look at the leaves on Eutrochium dubium, you can see that there's three distinct veins, right? Can you see the mouse cursor on there? Okay, right in this area, you can see the one, two, three, and that's only present on that particular species. Solidago, so solidago is from the Latin, meaning becoming in reference to its medicinal uses. So if you have a solidago that has bluish gray stems, that would be solidago cassia. If you have a solidago that has wrinkled leaves, solidago rugosa. And finally, if you have a solidago that has rigid, inflexible, and stiff stems, solidago rigida. So lobelia. So this is named after Matthias Lobel, which is a, who is a Flemish physician and botanist. If you have a lobelia with bright scarlet or cardinal red flowers, lobelia cardinalis. Or the lobelia that they believed could be used to uh, treat syphilis would be lobelia syphilitica. So now we're going to talk about subspecies. So a subspecies is a distinct variant of the main species. So these are going to be preceded in the botanical name by uh, sub-SP or occasionally you'll see SSP. So the example here, uh, when you have subspecies, the species will more or less represent the one that it has the widest range. And then the subspecies will have uh, smaller ranges. So we have Carex bromoides. And so bromoides uh, resembling the genus Bromus, which is a grass. So the subspecies bromo bromoides, and you can see uh, how widespread that range of it is. And then we have Carex bromoides subspecies Montana, 
which means related to the relating to the mountains, and you can see there that its range is more isolated to the mountains. All right, so varieties. So these are used to recognize slight variations in botanical structure. So it's preceded in the botanical name by VAR. And here we're looking at Saracenia purpurea. So we have the variety Montana, and you can see that the range is more in the mountains. Saracenia purpurea variety Venosa, and that one's going to be more of a coastal species. And those typically have uh, pictures that are larger, or well, I guess larger in diameter, and there's fewer of them. And Venosa actually uh, translates to uh, the color of wine. And then we have uh, the variety purpurea, which you can see it's much more widespread, and this one is more present in the northeastern portion of the southeast. And they typically have pictures that are more horizontal to the ground. So form. So this is used to distinguish minor variations such as flower color. So it's preceded in the botanical name with an F, and these chance genetic mutations can be referred to as a sport, or uh, when they're selected and sold, they are known as cultivars. So we have Echinacea purpurea, and then the white form of that would be Echinacea purpurea form alba. So cultivars are a variation of a native species that is selected for specific characteristics which are maintained through stem cutting or tissue culture, and this is known as propagation, and that essentially produces a clone of the plant. So characteristics are typically selected for our interest. Um, they include flower or leaf color, sometimes disease resistant, depending on the uh, uh, plant, and also compact forms. And then you may come across native R, which is a common synonym for native cultivars. Some cultivars are simply good selections of wild type species. So here we have Phlox divaricata blue moon and Echinacea purpurea magnus. And both of these are genetically very similar to the uh, uh, wild species. Um, they're selected essentially because they uh, have good growth genetics and have prolific flowering. So hybrids are gonna be crosses between different species. Um, for species of the same genus, a multiplication sign is used. And then if a hybrid results from grafting species of different genera, then an addition sign is used. Um, hybrids can also occur naturally. So uh, the example we have here is Dryopteris austra australis, which is the Dixie wood fern. And you can see that its parents are Dryopteris celsa and Dryopteris ludovicinia. Uh, species Celsa is actually a hybrid itself. So it's a hybrid of Goldiana and Ludovicinia. And then that one hybridized again with one of its parents, and that's what produced the Dixie wood fern. All right. So hybrid cultivars are any variety of a plant hybridized or cloned from a hybridized plant, which exists only in cultivation. So in the nursery trade, uh, hybrid cultivars are labeled by emission of the species name. So you may see Monarda purple rooster or Echinacea, purple, uh, pink double delight. And uh, this is either because the parents are unknown or they do not want to disclose the information. And this can be confusing for gardeners and researchers, creating lots of instances where hybrid cultivars are mislabeled with species names and marketed as species cultivars and not hybrids. Sometimes even hybrids of native and non-native species are market, marketed as native plants. All right, so this is just a review of botanical names and what you may see. So if we're referring to multiple species or an unknown species, we would use Echinacea as, uh, as species pluralis. Um, if it's going to be just the open pollinated species, it'd be Echinacea purpurea. If it's a white flowered form of that, it would be Echinacea purpurea form alba. Uh, an example of a cultivated selection could be of, of the form alba would be Echinacea purpurea white swan, or if it's a hybrid of two different species, you would no longer use purpurea, it would simply be Echinacea pink double delight. Benefits of cultivars and hybrids for the gardener. So these selections, and since they're clones, they're, you're gonna have set height and growth form, which can be beneficial in landscape design. You can get unique flower or foliage colors, um, a lot are selected because they do not self-sow. So if you have a 
particular uh, species that's prone to sowing itself around the garden everywhere. You can have a selection that doesn't seed out. Um, they may be selected for disease resistance. And also they're easier to propagate, so they're gonna be more readily available. This is gonna be another really good resource. Um, so Mount Cuba Center, they do garden trials. And uh, this is just a little snapshot of the one that they did uh, for the uh, genus Monarda. So over a period of three years, they uh, did a trial that included 40 species and cultivars. So each cultivar was evaluated weekly on characteristics like habit, foliage quality, floral display, and disease resistance, specifically uh, for powdery mildew, which is uh, a very common problem for uh, Monarda. They had a hybrid uh, that essentially did equivalent to, uh, so Monarda dark ponicum and the Monarda fistulosa clear grace, both were ranked as a 4.5 out of 5. Uh, Monarda dark ponic ponticum being a hybrid, and then Monarda fistulosa clear grace is actually a selection from, a, a, I believe, a garden in Mississippi. So that one was growing naturally, and they noticed that it didn't, uh, it was not susceptible to powdery mildew. So that's why that one was selected and uh, brought into cultivation. And then we have Monarda Garden View Scarlet, which is another hybrid. And then we have Monarda punctata. So if you're looking for a wild type species that has excellent powdery mildew resistance, that's a really good option. And then uh, Monarda didyma, Jacobs Klein, also did quite well, got a 4.0. Um, and uh, that one is another, uh, one that was selected from the wild uh, growing in an area near Blue Ridge Parkway. And then uh, just for comparison, we have Monarda fistulosa and Monarda didyma. Uh, fistulosa coming in at 2.4 and Monarda didyma coming in at 1.7. Disadvantages of cultivars and hybrids. There's a lack of genetic diversity since we're cloning the plant. They may be more susceptible to pathogens and other environmental stresses. So if you have just one cultivar planted out in your garden and something comes through a certain pathogen, it could wipe everything out. Or, you know, if we have a, uh, uh, you know, a year where the weather's more stressful, you know, we have a long drought, maybe the particular cultivar that you have isn't drought tolerant and you may lose your plants that way. So having the genetic diversity will make your plants more likely to be able to uh, uh, survive those sort of things. Um, they may be less adapted to local soil and climate, which can decrease the hardiness. So I had talked before about Claire Grace and Jacobs Klein. One was found in Mississippi, so people have grown it and done you know, tests and stuff with it in more northern areas like Vermont, and I'm gonna, I'll go over a research thing here soon, and they didn't have very good success with it, and that's because the genetics of that plant are, are uh, more adapted to the warmer climate. So for them, it didn't do very well. And then for uh, Jacobs Klein, it would probably be the same sort of thing. It was found in Blue Ridge, but you may have an area that it wouldn't do so well. Yes? Are they, are they still known as natives? Um, in my mind, if it is a selection of a native plant, then yes. So if it falls under the designation of a uh, cultivar where we're still using the species name, I would say yes. Um, if it's a hybrid variety, at that point I say no, that it's not, no longer a native plant. Um, if it hybridizes naturally in the wild, that's a different thing. Those would still be considered natives. But if someone's taking the plants and hybridizing them to, you know, with each other, then I think at that point it's not really considered a native. Okay. So what about pollinators and wildlife? So this is an important question due to the decline in pollinators and birds. So when a trait is selected for, other traits are diminished. So larger flower or double blooms may have little to no reproductive parts. Stamens are replaced by petals, which means that there's no nectar, pollen, or seeds for wildlife. And research is still in preliminary stages, but we can draw some conclusions from the research that has been done. And we'll take a look at a few studies here. All right, so Dr. Annie White in 2016 uh, did a study titled From Nursery to Nature, Are Native Cultivars Valuable to Native Pollinators as Native Species? So her conclusions were that pollinators strongly preferred the native species to the hybridized cultivars. And for a pollinator habitat garden, try to limit the use of cultivars to open pollinated seed grown selections or sports of the native species. Cultivars that differ significantly in color and morphology from the native species should be used cautiously and cultivars with hybrid origins 
should be avoided in the context of pollinator habitat restoration. She has a, um, a YouTube presentation that's available, and I encourage you know anyone who's interested to check it out. But this is a, sort of what she came up with as her general guideline. So you can see that the best ones for pollinators are going to be either the unmodified native species or those that are minimally modified. Uh, the ones that you know have flower color changes or um, those sort of things would be still good for pollinators. And then the ones that are highly modified, it's going to be variable. Some may not be beneficial at all, and some just may be less beneficial. But in her study, she did find that the ones that were more highly modified tend to not be visited by the pollinators, so they kind of uh, showed which ones they preferred. Right. Another portion of her study was to look at the available nectar in Lobelia. So we have Lobelia cardinalis and Lobelia syphilitica, which is uh, the um, cardinal flower and the great blue Lobelia. And then these are two hybrids that are produced by crossing the two together. So one thing to know, the um, Lobelia cardinalis is typically visited by hummingbirds for the nectar. And the Lobelia syphil uh, syphilitica, um, though hummingbirds do visit, it is typically more uh, bumblebee pollinated. So she found that hybrid cultivars contain only 20% of the nectar available to hummingbirds from Lobelia cardinalis. So you can look here, uh, the cardinalis is on the far left and the uh, Lobelia syphilitica is on the far right and it kind of shows that the hummingbirds are visiting the cardinal flower because of the nectar that's available. Whereas for the, uh, the great blue Lobelia, there's not as much available nectar there. So you would, may think that you cross the two together and you'd end up somewhere in the middle, but it was actually about the same, if not slightly less. So do cultivars of native plants support insect herbivores? So this is a study that was done in uh, 2018. So they studied the ecologic value of woody plant cultivars. So their conclusions were selections with red and purple leaves were consistently less eaten compared with straight species. They, uh, they did find that there was no evidence that enhanced fruiting, leaf variegation, disease resistance, and altered growth habit degraded the insect-based food webs. And uh, another thing they stated was more research is needed to study the nutritional value of variegated leaves due to their lack of chlorophyll. So when you have uh, leaves that are variegated, that's where the variegation com comes from. There's a lack of chlorophyll in that portion of the leaf. All right, so here's a review. Common names aren't specific enough to be a reliable way to identify plants. So we should be trying to use botanical names. Uh, botanical names consist of one genus and one species and refer to one specific plant. A species name can only be used one time in each genus. When pronouncing names, just sound it out. Species commonly describe a unique aspect of the plant. Cultivars are selections of plants that are propagated creating genetic clones. Cultivars can range from selections of wild type species to hybrids of native and non-native species. Based on current research, native cultivars that are similar or only slightly modified from the wild type species are just as beneficial to pollinators. Hybrid cultivars that have highly modified flowers are less or non-beneficial to pollinators. And then for restoration projects, it is best to choose wild type species uh, and then uh, that are local to the area. And essentially the best way to do it would be doing, uh, do seed collection and grow that way. And those would be the ones that are gonna be most adapted to the area. All right, so uh, these are the resources that I use, different websites. And then all the photos of the natives come from our uh, plant gallery. And here's the uh, photo credit for every, everyone that I borrowed a photo from. And then you can, uh, access this on the footer of the web page or on the home page in the middle. You can follow that link there. There are plants that still need photos, so if you do have pictures you'd like to share, uh, help others recognize and appreciate your favorites, um, you can send photos of buds, blooms, leaves, and seed pods to Bettina. And I think specifically uh, she had mentioned wanting to get seed pods and seeds uh, pictures. You can email her and she can give you an idea on that, but I, I think having a ruler next to the picture you're taking would be beneficial. That way people can really see the, you know, sort of the size and 
And then finally, these are the books um, that I use. So I use the Gardner's Botanical, an encyclopedia of Latin plant names. And it has uh, 5,000 uh, different uh, uh, translations for um, both uh, genera and species. And then I reference wildflowers of North Carolina just to try to find species that had uh, name overlaps in different uh, genera. And then uh, there's the, uh, uh, the two research articles that I uh, cited.